Dear colleagues, here is a video presenting the five principles of Restricted Kinematic Alignment Protocol. I am Pascal André Venditoli. I'm an orthopedic surgeon working at Maisonneuve Rosemont Hospital in Montreal and a professor of surgery at University of Montreal and a proud member of the Personalized Arthroplasty Society. The ideal way to improve our patient satisfaction and knee function is to reorient our alignment goal towards a more personalized target. We should applaud Stephen Howell, who proposed to restore patient knee anatomies with the kinetic alignment technique. I started K in 2011 after listening to one of his presentations. I owe him a lot. Thanks, Stephen. Do I feel that K is a great option? Certainly. So why am I proposing a restricted kinematic alignment option? Looking at the anatomy of 4,800 patients who scheduled for total neuroplasty, we observe that the mean HK is very near neutral. However, the anatomy variation is very wide with 19% of the cases with the HK above five degree and 3% with the HK above 10. From study like one by Bergman, where they measured the intraarticular load in vivo, we learned that there is a direct correlation between lower limb alignment and intraarticular load. Total knee implants and their fixation methods may not be tolerant as cartilage and bone to overload. That is why we should question ourselves. Should all patients anatomy be reproduced? From total hip replacement experience, we know that a severe hip dysplasia anatomy is not compatible with our implants and should be adapted. Is it the same for total knee arthroplasty? Should we reproduce blindly all anatomies? I believe we should not because some pathoanatomies exist and should be modified to be compatible with our current implants. Then what should be the, the thresholds? We know from Mr. Call's study that in MATK, there was no correlation between HK variation between plus minus three degrees and implant survivorship. To be in a safe zone, this will be our first RK principle out of five. Post-operative HK should be maintained within plus minus three degrees. If we look at patient anatomy more in details, we observe that the mean lateral distal femoral angle and the medial proximal tibial angle are approximately three degrees. There were also around 20% of the patient with these value above five degrees. As a second RK principle, I suggested to limit the LDFA and MPTA, which create joint obliquity, to a maximum of five degrees. This limit corresponds to the mean value plus two degrees. Following the first two RK principles, in 51% of the cases, you will perform true K without modifying patient anatomy. For another 30% of the case, you will need to adjust patient anatomy by less than one degree. Now, we need to discuss how to perform the anatomical modifications for the 20% of cases left. When performing the anatomical modifications, the goal will be to minimize their impact on ligaments laxity and joint kinematic. To plan our anatomical modifications, let's get go back to patient anatomy and determine our third principle. Most anatomical studies agree that collateral ligament tension is subjected to individual variability, but in general, females are more lax, MCL is tighter than LCL, and both collaterals are tighter in extension than in flexion. The key point is that in a native knee, collateral ligaments are not isometric. Restoring normal ligament laxities will favor joint kinematic and correlate in clinical study with higher patient satisfaction and better clinical scores. A short-term follow-up. Our third RK principle is to restore native knee collateral balance and laxities versus aiming for a ligament isometry. We should avoid all gap balancing related technique to modify bone resection. The next question to answer is 
when anatomy adjustment are required, where should it be performed? On the tibial side, the femur side, or both bones? We know that the femoral anatomy is the key of the knee joint kinematics. Maintaining its flexion axis orientation and joint surfaces anatomy is a priority. This is our fourth principle. When performing anatomical modification to reach our RK thresholds, we should favor femoral anatomy preservation. Let's see in cases example how this is feasible. Now, let's look at the valgus knee. Mild valgus knee have increased valgus of the femur with still some virus on the tibia. In most of these cases, the LDFA is above 5 degree. So when we are aiming at 3 degree HK, we will need to modify the femoral anatomy by bringing down the LDFA to a maximum of 5 and it will be usually enough to be within the plus minus 3 threshold for the HK, HKA. So in valgus knee, femoral modification is unavoidable. This is a typical example of a mild virus where the femur is in 4 degree of valgus and the tibia in 8 degree of virus. By reducing the tibia from 8 to 5, we are able to reach our plus minus 3 degree boundaries for HKA. Modification is only required on the tibial side and femoral anatomy is preserved. In more severe virus cases, both the femur and the tibia are in virus. This is an example where the femur is in 2 degree virus and the tibia in 7 degree. To reach the maximum HK of 3 degrees by adjusting the tibial cut alone from 7 to 1, we will have a significant impact on the tibial anatomy and the flexion space. To avoid this significant tibial modification, I suggest to balance the adjustment. So if we bring down the femoral virus to two degree modification, we can reduce the tibia virus from seven to three degrees and be within our threshold of plus minus three degrees of HKA. In more severe valgus, both the femur and the tibia are in valgus. In this example, the femur is in seven degree valgus and the tibia in two degree valgus. Performing femoral adjustment alone would impact the femoral anatomy significantly. As for severe virus knees, to minimize anatomy mod modification, we should balance the adjustment with the tibia bringing down the femur from 7 degree to 5 and change the tibia from 2 degree valgus to 2 degree virus will balance the resection on both bones. As you see, the severe valgus and severe virus knee should not be managed similarly uh, to optimize femoral anatomy preservation. The last principle to define is the selected pivot point when performing the adjustments. Let's see what I'm talking about. On the left image, if we use a lateral pivot point, we resurface the lateral compartment and adjust the medial side. 10 millimeter is resected on the lateral condyle and lateral tibial plateau. Angulation modification will affect the medial compartment resections. In the center image, it is a medial pivot point. As you can see here, in this situation, more bone is resected in the lateral compartment. On the right image, it's a central pivot point. This produces a balanced bone resection. Using a medial pivot point is the least interesting option. It loosens the lateral compartment and removes too much bone on the lateral tibial plateau. Using a central pivot point on the right image will, uh, with a balanced resection, complexify the decision making and makes it only applicable with sophisticated planning method like uh, with patient specific instruments. My preferred option is to use the lateral pivot as we are used to do in traditional total knee replacement. This will leave us with a tighter medial compartment in case of modification, which we are used to deal with. Now let's look at the valgus knee. On the left image, if we use a lateral pivot point, as in the virus knee, we loosen the medial compartment. 
which is not ideal for the valgus knees. In the center image, it's a medial pivot point. As you can see here, we maintain the medial compartment stability and create a tighter lateral compartment as in regular practice. On the right image, it is a central pivot point. This produces a balanced bone resection. Similarly to the varus knee, the ideal solution is to resurface the intact compartment and use it as the pivot point. Here is the fifth and last principle. As a landmark, I suggest to resurface the intact compartment and adjust the cut angle on the worn side. Modifying the worn side resection thicknesses for varus knee, we resurface the lateral compartment and adjust the medial side for valgus knee, we do the opposite by resurfacing the medial side and adjusting the lateral compartment. To simplify the decision making, here is the RK alignment algorithm to follow for each patient. It is a simple algorithm and we will use it together in the following slide in case examples. This algorithm helps you to follow our five RK principles and favor adjustments on the most contributing bone to the deformity while aiming for femoral anatomy preservation. Let's see some cases example. Here is a 57 year old man with HK of three degree with the LDFA of two degree valgus and MPTA of three degree varus. Both LDFA and MPTA are within RK boundaries of a maximum of five degree. The arithmetic sum of LDFA and MPTA equals one degree virus, which is within the RK boundary of plus minus three degrees. We can proceed with bone cuts without any adjustment. Thus, we perform a true kinematic alignment in this case, which correspond to about 50% of the patient that we see in practice. Here is another case with severe valgus of 17 degrees. The femur is at 9 degree valgus and the tibia 3 degree varus. We need to bring down the femur to a max of 5 degrees. With a femur at 5 degrees valgus and a tibia at 2 degree varus will produce a HK of 3 degree valgus. Here is the post-op radiograph of this patient where a correction of three to four degrees was uh, required. So minimal ligamentous release would, was needed, but to a lesser extent than with mechanical alignment. Now a severe virus case with 25 degree virus HKA. The femur is with one degree valgus and the tibia with 10 degree virus. The tibia exceed our boundaries of five degree MPTA. So we must reduce it to a maximum of five. Then femur one degree valgus plus five degree varus equals a HK of four degree varus. This is outside our safe range. For varus knee, I suggest to add some valgus to the femur to obtain a HK of three degrees. Here is the post-op radiograph where the deep MCL was released to balance the knee and no additional uh, soft tissue release was needed. To perform restricted kinematic alignment, you need a clear understanding of each patient anatomy. So it is best performed with intraoperative direct feedback with computer navigation or robotic or a pre-op planning as with personalized instruments. I used both techniques over the last 10 years with, with success. I proposed in 2011 the restricted K protocol and published different papers reporting the clinical outcome using both navigation and personalized instruments. Here is a study where we compared 18 cases of restricted kinematic alignment with 18 cases of mechanical alignment using the same implant. Post-operative 3D kinematic analysis with the knee KG system was compared between the TK patients and 170 LT controls. Looking at some important uh, dynamic uh, measure during a gait, there was significant difference for all the, in, the, uh, the outcome measure uh, when we compared the mechanical alignment cases with LT control. 
whereas there was no significant difference comping our KATK cases with LT controls. We also saw significant improvement in the post-operative CUS score for the kinematic alignment patients. Plus 13 point is a major difference for our patient function. In another study, we obtained a mean forgotten joint score of 77 when we know that the usual mean value for UK are between 67 and 74 and TK 55 to 65. These results with kinematic alignment total knee are really uh, appealing. Is there some contradiction to kinematic alignment? Even if the restricted protocol include the vast anatomical variation, it is not designed to take in account specific situation like acquired extraarticular deformities or other situation where the periarticular soft tissues have been severely modified by the disease process. And last, aberration of the human being which are not related to their particular bony anatomy can be problematic if we restore their native anatomy. So in these obese patients with valgus knee, often they are not happy if we keep their knocking knees after the surgery. I believe that restoring patient anatomy and joint kinematics are the key to improve their clinical outcome. Restricted kinematic alignment is the ideal compromise to achieve these goals while avoiding reproducing pathological anatomies and keeping the lower limb alignment in a safe range compatible with implant long-term survivorship. After more than 40 years of mechanical alignment, I am surprised that it lasted so long. I would invite you all to join the personalized arthroplasty society and be part of this important paradigm change thank you very much merci beaucoup et bonne fin de congrès